Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Bangladesh launching event for the Safeguarding Resource and Support Hub. Here is Wujdan Jarrah, and I'm the Global Delivery Manager, and I'm also leading both MENA and South Asia Hubs. We all agree as humanitarian workers and representatives of local, international NGOs, or even UN agencies or development actors that safeguarding is a right to workers in the sector and receivers of services, especially the most vulnerable. Safeguarding means preventing harm to people and the environment in the delivery of development and humanitarian assistance. To, add, to do this, organizations must focus on preventing and responding to issues that arise within their own organizations, as well as those, those that happen as a result of the organization's interaction with, wider, with, with the wider community. Today, we will take you through the Bangladesh Hub Luncheon event to highlight a unique service offered by Resource and Support Hub, offered by Resource and Support Hub. The Resource and Support Hub program aims to support organizations in aid sector to strengthen their safeguarding policies and practices against sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment uh, to support them working in both humanitarian and development sectors, but it's driven by uh, the need of a smaller national and less resourced CSOs in, de in developing countries. The Resource and Support Hub is, is funded by the UK aid, the UK government, Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office to help organizations again around the world, uh, around the world. And it's a consortium led by options with social development direct as a technical and delivery lead and including International Council of Voluntary Agencies, Techdizom, SightSaver, and Clear Global. We will start with sharing FCDO's priorities around safeguarding delivered by Matt Cannell, the Deputy High Commissioner and Development Director, British High Commission in DECA. Then we will go to listen to our team leader based in London about introduction about the resource and support hub in global level. Following to that, we will move to hear about Bangladesh country assessment and country strategy delivered by Bangladesh, Bangladesh National Representative Shanaz Rahman. And next we move to a tour of Bangladesh hub to safeguard in journey, key resources and tool by Esther Farkas, our resource and support hub digital communication and content manager then we move to listen to the field. Reflections from four CSOs and the PSIA network coordinator on the importance of safeguarding in aid sector. And lastly, we will end up with the Q&A, with the, with the questions and answers and a closing remark. Additionally, several questions again will appear for you to provide us with the feedback on the event. Without further ado, let us start with our first speaker for today, Matt Cannell, the Deputy High Commissioner and Development Director, Br Br British High Commission in DECA. Over to you, Matt. Thank you very much, Wejan. Um, nice to see everyone virtually. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk to you all today. Uh, my name is Matt Cannell. Uh, as introduced, I'm the uh, Deputy High Commissioner and Development Director. Um, sexual uh, harassment and abuse is one of the top issues on my mind. Um, and I'll just say a bit about my sort of experience before we get into a few remarks. So I've worked in the development humanitarian sector for about the last 20 years. And I suppose the first 10 years of those I would say that we, being honest, we didn't spend enough focus time on talking about these really difficult issues. Um, sexual exploitation and abuse and harassment has been going on for years. I think there was a wake up call in, in the UK when we had um, a scandal affecting one of our organizations that we worked with. And at the time I was working in our headquarters uh, and that drove a whole series of reflections across the UK government around you know, the fact that we'd, we'd probably known about these uncomfortable truths, that we weren't really asking difficult questions around you know, how do we protect beneficiaries 
fellow colleagues, workers, partners from from the dearth of uh, sexual exploitation and harassment. And I think in that following, you know, six years or seven years, we've made huge progress, I would say, of being confident to talk about these issues. Um, but also there's lots, uh, lots of, of things that we need to do more. So uh, here in Bangladesh, I'm responsible for our overall aid budget. Um, so our bilateral aid program, and we have really, really, really strong partnership and relationships with our delivery partners who are ultimately professional, who are our trusted partners, but equally with all partners, we have to ask difficult questions. Um, because sexual exploitation and abuse or sexual exploitation can happen in, in any place. And that's the sort of the point of it. Just a bit of context here in Bangladesh. And for those of you who are in Bangladesh at the moment, I don't have to dwell too much on this. So of the things that I worry about <laughs> as a development director spending uh, millions of pounds of taxpayers money, I would say SEAH is one of the top risks that I is on my mind. Um, and that's because the context around us, we know that there are power imbalances, particularly affecting women and girls or uh, vulnerable people like disabilities or people with protected characteristics or the LBTQI community. We know that those, those people, those imbalances lean to vulnerabilities and vulnerabilities is where people who carry out um, these, these acts exploit people. So there is a high level of inequality um, and vulnerability. I mean, just a few statistics to back that up. Um, some 80% of women during their married life are attacked at least once at home. Um, we think there's been an increase in sexual violence around 20% over the COVID period of time, COVID period of time. We've got data that says over 715 girls have been raped. 226 of them were multiple victims, 140 of those were multiple rapes. Um, these are the tip of the iceberg of some of the data that we see. And so sort of coming back to that, the operating environment and the context um, in, many, in many places around the world, we just need to be alive to the context that we are operating in. And of course, we also have a million Rohingya vulnerable communities in the south of Bangladesh. And we know from experience and data and evidence that uh, humanitarian settings are particularly at risk uh, for SEAH. Um, and we need to be particularly vigilant in, in, in those settings. Um, I've been doing this job for about a year and a half. And the first conversation I have with every delivery partner's head of agency will include a dialogue on this. And that's not to put people in the spotlight. That's not to cause assertions about we don't trust our partners, but it's just the importance that we attach to it as a UK government and me to personally, that we all need to take action on this important agenda. Um, what I'm heartened to see is there is action happening in Cox's Bazaar in particular. Um, we've funded an SEAH coordinator, which is starting to connect uh, between different agencies. I think we've made progress on training, on systems. I still think we've got lots more work to do on creating a culture where we can talk openly about sexual exploitation and abuse and sexual harassment in a meaningful way and also things like data sharing information sharing between organizations is still a thorny issue in our in fcdo foreign commonwealth and development office we ref, we have a what's called a safeguarding policy personally uh, that's our policy i don't like the term i think safeguarding dumbs down the issue you know, what we're really talking about is protecting people for sexual against sexual exploitation or sexual harassment. And that's an important thing to, to sort of non, non, not dumb down, not diminish the importance of the issue. When we, when we talk about safeguarding, uh, we mean three things really. Preventing it from happening, listening to people who are, can have concerns, and responding to survivors. So people that are experienced this, uh, if they do, how we respond to them um, in, in a meaningful way. I've had a number of SEA cases come across my desk. And um, when we say zero tolerance, we really do mean zero tolerance. But we don't mean zero reporting. So if you're worried about 
oh, does my organisation, do we get in trouble if we start reporting these cases? What's the UK government going to do? Um, the important thing to do is use our reporting. We have uh, a reporting concerns hotline and also an email address that you'll all be aware of. Really, really important. Use that. Use that way of sharing information with us on what's happening, what you're worried about and where you have cases. So when, when I say the UK government has a zero tolerance for it, that doesn't mean I don't want you to report it. It's the reverse. Please tell us about it. Um, and again, some of our, you know, some of the difficult cases I think we've we've dealt with have come from partners coming to us at an early stage and sharing information to us. Where where things get much more difficult is I've had a couple of cases where partners haven't shared information and then it's come out in the public domain. Please please report hotline. Um, and it's there. It's not going to get you in trouble. It's not in the organisation. It's the reverse. Please, I'm I'm sort of where I have projects that aren't reporting concerns, I sort of always ask the question, well, what's, why is that? What's, what's happening? I'd say we're also committed over the long term. This isn't something we're going to fix overnight. We recognize that this is behavioral change in many ways. It's to changing people's behaviors over a long period of time. And, and we also need to avoid a perception that we won't work in certain contexts because of the risk. You know, if I was really worried about the risk of working in humanitarian settings, we would stop, but that's not the purpose of it. To lastly say about the RSH Bangladesh hub. So when I first heard about this, I, I'm just really, really excited about it. It's a brilliant resource. It's something that we've invested in. It's with the reason we've invested in, in that is because we recognize how difficult these issues are, how they are cultural, how they are context specific. And now they are require us to invest in the long term. Um, so it's designed to help you, really. It's designed to give you the resources that you need to help you deal with what is a very difficult set of issues. And I sort of, having been working in the aid sector for a while, I sort of want to emphasize that, that there, these are tricky issues to manage and there is human behavior behind it. So the, the RSH Bangladesh hub is, is designed to be your friend basically to help you and you know the some of the things the products that the team have got together is they've done country level assessments on the website they've held workshops to validate the country level assessments they've started tr translating and contextualizing a range of safeguarding resources so sort of understanding what's what's the safeguarding issue what's what's not they've mapped and started to engage different stakeholders uh, to find out what others are doing across the PSEA network. Um, so there's a, there's a huge resource out there, and I just say it's there for the benefit of you. So please, please use it. Please um, give us feedback on how it is, how useful it is. Um, I met with the team when they came over here to do their study, and I guess, again, it's, it's a really great team and a resource to, to draw on, and I, I just encourage you to, to use it. Um, I think that was my main main things. So I've just come back to to what I what I said um, at the start that I I UK government and us here in Bangladesh. I think we all you know want to um, eradicate this issue that we don't have it anymore. That is going to take time. Let's be realistic about it. Um, it takes us to work in partnership through talking about difficult issues, talking about additional training needs, sharing information, and most importantly, whenever you have a case, please use the reporting concerns and talk to us about it, because I know, you know, these are, these are challenging issues. Cool. I will stop there. And a big thanks to the RSH team as well, of course, for putting all of this together. And also a particular thanks to Marilyn in my team, who, if I was to say one of the brilliant resources I have in our in office, Marilyn, who I work with, has really been a lead champion and helped me in the office to champion this cause across the whole of the mission. And, you know, that leadership role that uh, Marilyn plays, I, I just encourage you to think in your organisations, who plays that leadership role in my organisation? Who's, who's our Marilyn, if, if, if that makes sense, that we can really be the sort of the eyes and ears and the knowledge resource that can help us all address this issue. The valuable input that FCTO is, is giving and highlighting is really important and safeguarding is important and we normally link safeguarding with accountability. With that, let's move to our next panelist.
uh, our team leader who is based in London, Emma Wukui, and she will give us more information about the resource and support hub. Over to you, Emma. And really just to say thanks to, to Matt for kind of initially discussing, you know, what this means to FCDO and also their approach. And FCDO have been a, a leading thinker in safeguarding globally. Um, so we really appreciate the support from, from the Bangladesh office. Um, a really warm welcome to everyone again, um, and thanks so much for joining us for this launch. Um, my name's Emma Wakaru, I'm the team leader and I'm based in, in London. Um, I wanted to spend a short period of time really giving a brief introduction to the Safeguarding Resource and Support Hub and really to capture kind of what we have on offer um, as well as to flag you know, what you can, can get out of this. Um, so the Resource and Support Hub was set up in 2019. Um, it is funded initially by the Foreign Commonwealth um, Office in the UK and was set up to offer free and accessible um, support to organisations working in the aid sector. Um, the Resource and Support Hub was set up to really strengthen safeguarding policy and practice against sexual exploitation, abuse and sexual harassment. And Matt has touched on some of the, the figures in Bangladesh, um, but we know that worldwide there is not enough being done in safeguarding. And we want to make sure that all organisations are able to protect their staff, um, their representatives who they work with, so that could be consultants or volunteers, and also the communities which, which they're working in. Overall, we want to make sure that because the aid is being delivered, we are not doing any harm to the communities or to those within the organisations. And this is regardless of what donor you're funded by or what sector you're working in or what type of deliverables you're trying to deliver on your project. So we recognize that safeguarding policies are needed. They're often needed for, for funding and um, for donors, but also to make sure that we have, you know, reporting lines outlined. But we also mentioned, as Matt commented, that safeguarding goes beyond policies and it goes into what is being done. You know, how is it being put into practice? We at RSH recognize that we need to look at the culture and leadership within organizations and really start to untangle some of the, the you know, challenging behaviors, the beliefs which exist within um, organizations. Um, Matt also touched on various different um, vulnerable groups and power imbalances. And for RSH, we see this to be the root cause of um, safeguarding concerns and safeguarding issues which arise. So we want to make sure that within our work, we're looking at all groups who we're working with, from you know, race to ethnicity to sexuality, and make sure that we're being as inclusive as possible within our organizations. So, so with all that in mind, it does feel like a big task. Um, and so I wanted to share what RSH has already done because we have been operational for four years. Um, we have set up an online hub, which you will hear a bit more about later on. Um, this is for a global audience, so whether you're based in Bangladesh or you know, somewhere else in South Asia or, or somewhere else globally, there is an online hub which is there for you. And the idea is that we are able to provide short, practical, accessible resources for organisations. We also want to hear from organisations through our online hub and really understand kind of the journey or the challenges that, that you're going through. Um, we also work specifically with organisations. So we have our hub now in Bangladesh and we have Shanaz, who you will hear from next as our national representative. We're also operational in four different regions of the world and across 11 different countries. So we are gradually starting to understand what are the needs of civil society organisations? What are the challenges? And often what are the contextual changes that are happening in country that we need to adapt our, our systems and, and, and policies around? 
we have experience on RSH working in many different setups. So we do work in um, emergency responses in the, the Ukraine response. We work in MENA where there's um, protracted crisis and we work in the development sphere. So we have a whole host of learnings which we are trying to build a story about. Um, and going forward, we're really excited to learn more about what it takes to make change in Bangladesh. Um, some of my the key messages that I wanted to share is that the resource and support hub is a, is a free resource which is here for you as organisations who are delivering in Bangladesh. Um, we're here to add value and we're very much here to work with existing initiatives. So we want to work with the PSEA network. We'll be working with INGOs, we'll be working with donors, and we're really looking to kind of bring together a discussion around safeguarding to create a culture of talking about these difficult issues and really being able to tackle them within organisations to make sure that aid is being delivered safely. So we want to hear from you. Um, we want to understand your safeguarding journey. We recognise that within safeguarding, um, it is a long journey, you know, from having a policy to putting referral mechanisms in place, managing any um, investigations which come in. And I think Matt mentioned that RSH is kind of here as a friend, and he's actually exactly right. We're here, you know, we are not here as a donor. We are not here to report case by case. We are here really to support and to build your organisation as much as we can with our national safeguarding experts. Um, so we want to hear from you. We now have a dedicated um, Bangladesh team who will um, you know, be working with lots of different experts around Bangladesh based on the region or the area of, of safeguarding that we will work in. Um, and so I hope that everyone will find RSH um, a good resource. We love to hear feedback from you. And that's kind of what drives us. That's what keeps us making changes and um, giving you a better service for your organization. So before I hand over to Shanaz, I would just really say, you know, don't be a stranger with the resource and support hub. We would love to hear from you. Um, we would love to support if possible. We have different platforms through our online hub or in country where we can um, engage with you and promote the work that you're already doing and really to understand, you know, what does it take to create change in, in the Bangladeshi context? Thank you, Emma, for the clarification about the resource and support hub. Minna 2021 and uh, ending in Asia 2022. We will move now. I'm speaking about the journey of the resource and support hub. And thank you very much for highlighting that it's a journey Emma, and it's behavior change. And we are there as a friends. So moving to our, let's say, the, the big friend in Bangladesh, uh, Shanaz Rahman, who will give us a brief about the country assessment findings, recommendations, and Bangladesh strategy. Over to you, uh, Shanaz. Thanks, Vajdan. Welcome, everyone. I'm, I'm very glad to take you through the Bangladesh country strategy. So Bangladesh country strategy has been developed based on the Bangladesh country assessment. Bangladesh country assessment that we conducted during the last year. And the assessment was conducted uh, aiming that we will achieve, we will get the overall um, idea about the landscape of the Bangladesh and also aiming to inform the design and operationalization of resource and support hub in Bangladesh. The country assessment, it provides detail on the national context. Uh, who are the key stakeholders, the initiative that uh, already uh, going forward and uh, the resources that are available and uh, the resources and uh, capacity that exist around the SEA, SEAH. The country assessment also provide us that what are the major strengths that country are uh, going through in terms of PSE and safeguarding? Where are the major gaps? Where the CSO identify the major needs and also provide recommendations? What should be the immediate priorities and opportunities for the hub going forward? So ba based on the, these objective, the country assessment conducted where we have got some significant findings and the method we have followed in the country assessment was the mixed, mixed method approach, where the desk review online survey 
key informant interview, stakeholder consultation, and the FZD was conducted. Then the major findings from the, from the country assessment, um, the Matt, Matt and Emma was speaking about the cultural shift, the zero tolerance. So major issues that came uh, from the country assessment was the social and cultural norms that actually allow uh, violence, especially towards the women and children and the sensitive vulnerable communities. And also it includes the power privileges in relation to intersectional inequalities. And those identifies, uh, identified at the root causes of the uh, SEA. In the country assessment, we have seen the CSO have been identifying that the uh, concept of the safeguarding is emerging here at the country level, especially from child protection policy to safeguarding policy. In this journey, the clarity and distinction between the child protection policy and uh, between the protection program and safeguarding is something that need to be uh, clarified going forward. And based on that, we have seen in the country law in terms of the um, terminology is very new emerging here. The law, there has been significant amount of law, but specific law around SEA, which is something where we have seen there are challenges. The CSO um, have the, the program we all know here at the country level, the CSOs are there here today. Most of the participants are the local CSO. And they are, they are very much aware about the approach, the project-driven approach, where actually we have the resources available for a shortened period of time. And then we lose that resources once the project is in. So those project-driven modalities is actually one major barrier to create a sustainable um, capacity for the country level around PSEH. And that is something the CSO would be looking forward to strengthen going forward. The organization developed their country policy procedures. We have seen, we, uh, we found in the assessment that the policy and procedures has been developed long back and review of these policies and procedures haven't been quite frequently. And in terms of the safeguarding or PSEA policy, this has been developed kind of a silo. So when aligning the safeguarding policy with the organizational procedures, HR manuals, there are inconsistencies and where uh, the CSO, the aligning both the policy is something where people, uh, especially the CSOs were facing challenges that it does not align. And this is another area identified that where support would require. The accountability is another area that came uh, quite significant uh, in the country strategy especially accountability to our staff and also to the community, um, especially um, shifting our culture, leadership. So that is a, an area for, um, for our CSO to look at, especially for creating a safe and inclusive organization, especially the culture of zero tolerance, that is something need a significant shift. In terms of the uh, assessment findings, there are some recommendations also that the country assessment suggest going forward that RSH or, uh, looked to, uh, while developing the uh, country uh, strategy. The recommendation, the major recommendation was that CSO, I, RSH should support the small CSOs who are working in a wider coverage and uh, addressing the vulnerable communi communities and also the remote locations. RSH should support the less uh, resourced CSO to strengthen their organizational capacity on safeguarding and then ensuring that the resources and the uh, tools, everything that RSH support developing is localized, is contextualized and support the specific need of the CSO in terms of their um, specific location or in terms of their working with the different uh, vulnerable communities in different location. Collaboration with the government, another area came when IRSH would be supporting with the CSO. CSOs are working uh, closely with the government, especially uh, at the local level, the, the government bodies like Ministry of Women and Children Affairs, Ministry of Disaster Management, when supporting the most vulnerable communities during and after disaster. So those communities, those uh, group, those bodies of the government are very important for uh, the CSOs and at the same time for RSH to collaborate while supporting to the local CSOs. 
RSH acknowledged that uh, I, we work as a catalyst and we uh, work to ensure that safeguarding is embedded in the sector. Based on these assessment findings, now I will take you through that what we have in our country strategy. So in the country strategy, we have three major focus and then the focus has been crafted based on the assessment findings. So one major focus is, uh, is the capacity building. So when we saying the capacity building, this is not only the training, actually the capacity building is supporting the CSOs in aligning their policy and procedures and also ensuring the reporting mechanism that the proper mechanism is in place. RSH has unique program, uh, ask an expert and uh, also the all RSH provide the online uh, hub, online platform for the e-learning e e courses. And also RSH would be providing working closely uh, through the consultation and different uh, discussion with the CSO in contextualizing the tools and resources. Another area where I, I say it would be focusing, we have seen in the assessment findings and also it came uh, when Matt and Emma were saying about the cultural shift and the shift in the leadership and organizational culture. I say believe that um, building a sustainable program actually uh, required the shift at the governance, government, governance level of the organization. And for that, RSH have a flagship program that called mentorship program where we will work closely with the CSO and would be supporting them in shifting their culture and leadership. We'll be facilitating a process where the CSOs would be, would be supported. And also we would be creating a platform where the different challenging topics like power, leadership, implicit, explicit biases. So those discussion are there and we can openly share our challenges that how uh, we, we are developing, we can improve and we can learn from each other. The third focus, and it's very important that RSH would be collaborating with the existing initiative and platform. RSH, so that uh, the collaboration is in terms of, so that we support the better response to SCH and also uh, the strength and the safeguarding mechanism within the sector, including humanitarian and development, both the sector. And creating an opportunity for the CSOs where CSO can access a lot of resources, not only uh, uh, which are produced from RSH, but beyond. In the country uh, strategy, we are saying about the key approaches and the approaches uh, where, where that we will follow, that we will support the less resourced CSO. Gender and inclusion would be the center of our work, whatever we deliver. And, uh, the, and we will be impl implementing a program that is evidence-based and evidence are generated through the country assessment findings and also from the user survey. And the services we were delivering, definitely that would be tailored, contextualized, translated and blended. And uh, we would be uh, regularly taking guidance from the National Expert Board. This is a board established with the uh, expert from the country level who are working in the GBP, PSCA and protection sector and contribute in the module and materials that RSH would be producing going forward. Partnership in the, with the wider sector is another key approach that RSH followed. I said, believe that RSH is not going to do uh, everything, rather RSH would be working as a safeguarding expert and supporting the ex existing initiative. RSH program would be delivering mostly remotely, but we would also have in-person interaction, especially at the national level. So far, I think Matt have already mentioned that what are the progress so far at the country level we have uh, made, the country assessment we have, and also the validation workshop. We visited the CSO in eight division and talked to them and identified the same challenges came from the validation workshop. And also we are uh, in a process of contextualizing resources. You will see some of the progress while we will have a tour in our uh, hub in the next session. And then we are already engaged with the certain um, network that are functioning at the country level, including the PSCA network in the Cox's Bazaar. And uh, we are working together in a, to, a, to uh, support the overall uh, initiative around PSCA and safeguarding. And our national expert board had started functioning. And we have started, we have the support consultant directory and we have started recruiting the ex expert for that. 
RSH program, uh, when we talk about the, our program, the core of the program, that what is our sustainability approach? RSH, while RSH will be running the program, sustainability is from the very beginning we were considering in our uh, country strategy. RSH is a catalyst, as I was mentioning before, that we com complement other existing effort and uh, um, within this sector and build the sector from there. We invest our capacity to the local agencies. So we support the local CSO to avail the services as much as possible and support them to growing up. Our center of our um, sustainability approach that we, we support the shifting of the power, we support the changing governance of, the, of an organization and the culture of the organization. That is why we will be supporting the CSO and uh, we would be trying to creating some best practices that how organization can shift and uh, adapt a culture that is inclusive. And we managed to localize process. We will develop national affiliates. A national organization will be selected to take the ownership of the national hub and um, become fully responsible for the for operation of the hub and where RSA would be providing the mentoring support to the national CSO to grow. RSH would continue the negotiation discussion with the with our donor and funder, with the changing context around and the new risk around safeguarding. We would continue that discussion, and we would learn from our other hubs. RSH is, has been operationalized in Africa and the MENA region, and we have that learning, and we would be learning from that experience. Thank you. Thank you, Shanaz. The summary of the country assessment is available on the Resource and Support Hub website. And now we will move with our communication and content manager, Esther Farkas. Will, she will take us on a tour through the Resource and Support Hub website. Over to you, Esther. Thank you so much, Wetjdan. And uh, just a few words about uh, the next few minutes. I will first share a, a video basically showing you uh, all the fantastic resources that you can access through the RSH uh, online platforms. And then I will guide you through specifically the South Asia uh, hubs online presence and uh, show you specific uh, features and resources, some of which have already been mentioned. Out here on the South Asia hubs online platform, you'll be able to access the video that I'm going to show you now uh, with captions in multiple languages, including uh, Bangla. And uh, another word here, uh, you can always navigate back to the uh, global uh, hub. When you click on the icon there at the top right corner, you can navigate back to the global RSH website, uh, which obviously has uh, uh, even more resources than the resource library and links to all the local uh, platforms as well. So let's go ahead and watch uh, the video um, with Bangla subtitles. The Safeguarding Resource and Support Hub, or RSH. We are a UK aid funded program that supports organizations to improve their approaches to safeguarding against sexual exploitation, abuse, and sexual harassment, SEAH. On the RSH online platform, you'll find a library, an e-learning course, webinars, podcasts, a directory of safeguarding consultants, and more. Our online platform is available in English, Arabic, French, and Swahili. We support all organizations in the humanitarian and development sector, but we prioritize smaller local organizations. Let's take a look at what the Hub has to offer. Welcome to our library. Here, you can browse through hundreds of relevant resources, including our own tip sheets, tools and guidance that are short, practical, and easy to use. Search keywords or use our safeguarding journey to find what you need. The safeguarding journey will guide you through four stages of safeguarding. At each stage, you can find selected information and resources that we have chosen to help you every step of the way. Safeguarding Matters is our free e-learning course. It's designed for people who are new to safeguarding or who want to refresh their skills. Take the course online or offline and earn a safeguarding certificate. 
The modules take around one hour each and are free, interactive and story-based. If you need the support of the safeguarding consultant, you can search our directory by region, language and service and find the perfect fit. We also have national hubs that work directly with local organizations in the country. There are hubs in Nigeria, South Sudan, Ethiopia, Jordan, Syria, Yemen, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Each hub has its own online platform with context-specific resources in local languages. They also offer services like mentoring and advice. To keep up to date with our work, sign up for our newsletter and follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. Visit safeguardingsupporthub.org. Together, we can build a safer sector. So coming back to the online platform, uh, as we have seen in the video, the hub has uh, a lot of resources, which we truly hope that you'll make uh, use of. I want to firstly point out that the South Asia hub is now available not only in English, but in Bangla. So if you navigate to the top left corner, you can select your language and you'll be able to access uh, the website in, in Bangla and navigate through it in your language. I'll just uh, go back to English now because unfortunately I don't read or write Bangla. Uh, it has been mentioned that the um, uh, country assessment is available on the website. So if you navigate to what is safeguarding and scroll down, you'll be able to access the Bangladesh country assessment summary right here. When we go back to the resources tab, you'll find our resource library here. So you'll be able to search uh, the library by keyword or type of document. And just as a reminder, when you go to uh, this link, click here, you'll be able to access the full global library as well. And here you can filter down your results even more. So basically you can search by content, type of document, country, region, or even a type of safeguarding. Something that has been mentioned before is our interactive tool, the safeguarding journey. So when you click on this link, you'll be able to see uh, the journey, this interactive map, which is divided into four specific topics. And once you click on one of the topics, this sort of map is going to be pulled up. And here you can navigate the map and uh, essentially, it will take you to various topics where we collected specific resources related to that topic. So you can just browse through and um, navigate this page like this. What I'd like to here point out as well is that on every page of the RSH platforms, you'll find a link to our safeguarding essentials. And this is a package that we put together specifically for uh, smaller, less resource organizations, and especially those that um, are starting out on their journey. And we collected about 15 documents, which you can download as a pack, so as a compressed uh, zip folder, or alternatively, you can also browse uh, this package basically uh, by navigating through the topics here on the left, and then you can download those that are most relevant uh, to your specific phase of the journey itself. So just going back to highlight one more very important uh, resource that uh, Shanaz also mentioned. This is the e-learning course Safeguarding Matters, which is available uh, in seven languages. And when you navigate here to the Safeguarding Matters page on the South Asia Hub, you will find the contextualized version. So this version is contextualized to South Asia, and it's also now, uh, it's available, modules one and two are available in English, and module one, as of today, is also available in Bangla. So this consists of five modules. If you ever find a difficulty registering, this video will help you every step of the way. So feel free to play that and also just make sure if you need uh, Bangla captioning, then you can turn on uh, the, the subtitles and choose your language. And you'll be able to, once you complete the assessments for the five modules, you'll receive a certificate in your inbox. 
So going back uh, to the main menu, the direct support tab will guide you to the Ask an Expert page. And uh, Shanaz mentioned this service. This is available for uh, civil society organizations in, in Bangladesh and Pakistan. And uh, again, we have an animation here that explains to you the service, also with uh, Bangla captions. Uh, basically, you can write to us by email. I will put the links and, and uh, the, the email as well into the chat later on. You can write to us by email or also fill this um, access the form here, which is fully confidential. And you can write to us in English, Urdu, or Bangla, and you'll be paired up with a safeguarding expert who will then devote two days of expert advice um, tailored specifically to your question. Just a note here that this page is also available in Bangla language. So you'll be able to uh, read the information here in Bangla as well as access the form in your language. And last but not least, uh, you can also access the safeguarding directory. Very important uh, to note here that we keep adding consultants to, the, to this directory, which you can also search by services offered. And also uh, the consultants are split uh, also by uh, region and language offered. So it's worth checking back regularly. And I just like to point out that we have a newsletter that you're very welcome to sign up for because once you do, you'll receive uh, up-to-date information about webinars, podcasts, most recent resources, mentorship, and other important information. And just to highlight here at the top left uh, corner of the page, you can see the icons for our Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn channels. So you're very welcome to follow us on our social media and we hope to connect with you there as well. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Thank you. And as all of the uh, all of other other colleagues highlighted, it's a journey, and to have it easy because to us it's not not one of training. It's an institutional capacity. So every journey has building blocks. We start with what Esther displayed from what definitions and what the safeguard and move into how to assess my capacity, self assessment, and after that what I need to do to have a safeguard and or to safeguard the environment and ending up, what can I do if any problem arises? Thank you, Esther and all. And now we're moving to the feed. Where for the sake of the time, our next session will be conducted in Bangla for English speakers. Please switch the language to the English via the globe, uh, the globe icon in the uh, low right side of the toolbar below. Now we will listen to Shana's conversation with a number of CSOs in addition to the PSCA a network a representative who will be sharing experience on safeguarding. Over to you, Shanaz, and our distinguished speakers. Thank you very much, Weston. My institution name is Abash, which is a gender sensitive and awareness organization in the society. And I work in the south part of Bangladesh in six districts. And in this area, we have many vulnerable communities where we see the sexual harassment, abuse, and especially in the fisherman families. And we have very um, minorities group living in our areas, and they're in a great risk of gender-based violence. And they are a natural disaster in my area of operation. Due to those disaster, the women and adolescent girls from these areas, they face different kind of sexual attract or harassment. Nowadays, there is a harmful group developing youth, and they are very active in sexual harassment activities. And for this reason, my organization is taking different initiatives with association with different NGOs to raise awareness, to correct the behavior. We're trying to align with the government initiatives as well. There are a few initiatives also from government side on safeguarding policies. And in our area, the sexual harassment or gender-based violence is still kind of a taboo and they only blame the woman 
or the girls because of the incidents. Still, nobody accept the real fact and the required change. Uh, Previously, we work for FCDU and different NGO and foundation. We work for safeguarding policies. And there are different policies like women policy, child policy, different policy. We're trying to raise the awareness of practicing and we ourselves are practicing. And you won't believe that there are one and a half thousand associate organization working in this area, but they have a lack of knowledge because lack, lack of access to resource. What we need is the united initiative. Earlier, there was a very poor infrastructure for commuting to my area, but now it has been developed. So we have a scope to work on those vulnerable communities or rural area. And I do expect that you have taken a great initiative to develop this hub and that we can actually discuss about your, our organization, what we want to do, our initiative. We can access the resources. We really want to take the policy to the area people, and we want to develop committee, and we want to make that committee very localized, building with local people, and through them, we want to raise the awareness. We have seen this harassment in the schools as well for the adolescents' girls. So we really want to raise the awareness in the communities at the very basic level. So we really expect that separating policy work will not be limited in the national level. We really expect this work has to be done in the grassroots level. And the initiative taken by FCDO, we expect that it should be reached to door to door to make it a success. There are a lot of NGO they don't know about the PSEA issue. And we're hopeful that now we will get the scope to award those NGOs. And I want to thank RSH to develop this hub. And we are very hopeful that we all together can bring the change and bring the safeguard. I will go to the respect. Um, who is the PSE coordinator for Bangladesh, and uh, he is leading one of the big area in Cox's Bazaar, which is a complex. And yeah, Eric, we are going to hear from Dora as well. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Shahnaz, for the introduction. I will be talking in the next three minutes, covering most of the issues that have already been covered, but I'm really happy that I'm invited to have the chance to talk about sexual exploitation and abuse and harassment in the next three to five minutes. Uh, sexual exploitation and abuse are acceptable breaches of fundamental of UN core values. It constitutes the most serious breach of accountability, both in humanitarian and settings. The core created into zero policy is outlined in the UN Secretary General's bulletin in 2003. This bulletin, as we all know, serves as a code of conduct on SCA for UN staff and related personnel. This is very important. Related including, but not limited to, implementing partners, contractors, volunteers, and so on. As we all know, but it's good to keep that in mind again, that it prohibits the Secretary General's bulletin, prohibits the exchange of money, employment, assistance, goods or services for sex, including sexual favors or any other forms of humiliating and degrading acts. The policy also prohibits sexual activities with persons under the age of 18, regardless of the age of majority or consent locally. Working closely with PSA network partners, 
including 187 UN organizations, international organizations, national and local governmental or non-governmental organizations, and with all related stakeholders, including state actors, donors, international entities, we have been fighting against SCA, taking targeted actions to prevent and respond to any kind of sexual misconduct, that is including sexual uh, abuse, sexual exploitation, and sexual harassment. In line with the PSCA action plan in Bangladesh, that is true for Cox Bazar and for Dhaka, we aim to prevent SCA from happening in the first place, ensuring beneficiaries have safe and accessible reporting mechanisms. Beneficiaries are offered immediate and quality assistance when and if needed, and have their cases investigated in a prompt and safe way in accordance with the survivor-centered approach. In this fight against sexual exploitation and abuse, we welcome any support we can receive from all our allies, or as today we mentioned, from all our friends. Support can be in terms of funding or advocacy, or providing guidance, sharing good practices, keeping PSCA high on agenda in all fora. This is where Resource and Support Hub comes into the picture. We appreciate, as the PSCA network and all its members, staying up to date on much important PSCA and safeguarding issues, global and regional guidelines, checklists, online learnings, broadcast, and much more that we cannot name within my speech in this five minutes. We really appreciate resource and support hubs uh, involvement and their support on this. I'm here to thank to all who made this launch possible and for all your support to us who are working in the field to fight against sexual exploitation and abuse. I hope to continue working together and strengthening our coordination and cooperation day by day, starting with your presentation at our next PSCA network meeting in June. Well, thanks a lot again, and looking forward to having more coordinated and better coordination with you in the coming days and months. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bora. It was really wonderful to hear from you. Now we would move to the speech from uh, Mushid Alam Sharkar. For another priority, he was not able to join with us. Um, and uh, he will be representing us, the Silate and uh, the how the overall situation from there. Now, can I request my colleague, uh, Ista? Can you please uh, play the video so that we can hear his message? I want to thank, thank you everyone for giving me the opportunity to talk here. We really feel that we need to take initiative to solve the safeguarding issue or bring the safeguarding issue in the Hawar area because of the vulnerable community. The contribution of women is very limited and very frequently they are facing discrimination and they are facing a huge number of domestic violence. And due to the pandemic, it increases and another concern is child labor. And this lakeside area is a very disappointing image of that. Now, this is a cause of physical and mental health harmless. And also, you know that in this area, child marriage is a very normal case. And we have to work how to stop it and also the domestic violence. We need to work on the girls' education issue. And this area is a natural disaster prone area. And due to that, woman, child, and the elderly suffer a lot of discrimination. This is true that we have a lot of issues regarding safeguarding in this way, such areas, such as gender discrimination, awareness of women and child protection, and community safety. We hope that the resource and support hub will support us with the necessary guidance. And I want to thank everyone involved here for giving me the opportunity. Now I would like to invite, uh, I would like to thank all the CSOs who have presented their opinion at this stage. 
question is a previous question. And I'll take the multiple question for the next section. Thank you, Shanaz, and to all of the CSOs and the PSIA representative. I see we have some comments in the chat, and I will invite Shanaz to answer some questions that I'll be directing to you, or maybe to FCDO who are still with us, or any question to ask. Uh, Shanaz, we have a question on how uh, those resources or how activities will be disseminated in remote uh, level of CSOs. Thank you so much. Uh, the question, the, this is a very important question. And um, uh, we, we have the hub available for online, but who are staying at the remote and facing challenges in terms of accessing the hub, please feel free to communicate. I, I have my, you will get my mobile number as well when you are communicating me. So if you have any challenges reaching out through online, you can call me and uh, we can arrange discussion maybe in uh, other way, other than uh, meeting uh, online. And uh, also there are uh, CSOs who are working at your location, at your division. Uh, please, um, uh, I mean, communicate through them as well so we can support each other. Okay, and uh, thank you, Shanaz. Another question uh, about, is there is any plan to translate the hub materials, tools and materials into Bangla language? Yes, already we are working on this. You will find, uh, please, after this launch, visit our um, website, especially South Asia website. You will find a number of resources in uh, the local language, and we would continue that contextualization going forward. Yeah, and colleagues are disseminating some links on the chat in addition to Shanaz's email. Shanaz, will the CSOs be able to contact the National Expert Board? CSOs would not be able to contact the National Expert Board directly. You have to write to me if you want. If you have any specific issue that you want to take forward to the NED and ask their suggestion, so then you have to reach out to me. Then I can reach out to NED and communicate to you. Yeah. So just to complement what Shana said, um, there is difference between consultants that we host in our website that you can reach out to them and difference difference from the different from the national expert board who are local experts from different sectors who will be helping Shanaz in reviewing our, let's say, ongoing activities and plans and steer uh, the, the hub uh, and make it more appropriate for the local context. So th those are our national expert board who helping us in, oh, let's say, like oversight body of the program. Um, Shanaz, any resources for the safeguarding consultancies? But the safeguarding, we have the safeguarding consultant directory that we are building. We have uh, a consultant available right now. So please continue visiting our website. We will build that consultant uh, directory going forward. And we will, we will have, the, have more consultant and also detail that uh, how to reach out to them. Thanks. And uh, we had in the chat another request saying that they hope that there will be a regular meetings with the hub uh, and the CSOs and can how they can connect with this platform. I think we have Shana's email in the chat. Uh, Esther spoke about the newsletter and we will disseminate the a newsletter uh, link that you can subscribe to be updated on all developments in the hub and get in touch with the hub teams. Um, is there is any opportunity for physical trainings or in-person trainings for CSOs, uh, Shanaz? Actually, it, it depends based on the demand and uh, specific condition maybe. So please reach out to us bilaterally. At this point, there is no plan at this point, but please reach out by the tree. Okay, we have some questions like, do the country assessment have covered the garment worker situation? Most of the factors have not followed anti-harassment committees, AFWA uh, and PNPS have studies on garment workers. Uh, would you like to answer or shall I take that, uh, Shalas? Yes, I can. Um, so overall country assessment covered the overall situation that includes the private sector as well. So the governments fall under the private sector and uh, the analysis in terms of the legal policy procedures and safeguarding policy of the private sector that came during the assessment. 
Yeah. Thank you, and there is another question says, other than sexual abuse uh, and exploitation in addition to neglect in, neglect in families and communities, is there is any scope to discuss exploitation and neglect, neglect for being disabled? Is there is any scope or opportunities? This is a great question. Uh, we mentioned in our approach that inclusion and gender would be the center, whatever we are delivering. So in terms of uh, considering the person with disability, we are interested to contextualize the tools further and support the CSO, how the services that are providing through the CSO that can be sensitive to all the uh, communities who are sensitive or differently. Yeah. And going forward, think... we are also looking forward organizing different webinar and discussion around that. Yeah, there is another comment or request from the same person who asked that question about what all the facilitators are talking about are issues and concerns of safeguarding, uh, prevailing, preventing in prevailing in communities. Can we further talk or discuss on pillars or prime steps of safeguarding? Sure, I, I would suggest that please visit our website. We have a uh, online course, uh, Safeguarding Matters, and there we are talking about, you will find the details. And we also have a video that talks about the safeguarding journey, where you will see the pillars of the safeguarding in this journey at uh, different stages, what are the pillars. So I would encourage to visit and then you will find a lot of resources up there. Yeah, in addition to that, um... People from our, our guest speakers spoke about the local context, some protection concerns, and how is the context on the ground. While our hub, and as we uh, described before, we start from what is safeguarding, and after that, how to assess the organizational capacity when it comes to the safeguarding, move into action planning in addition, lastly, to what should I do as an organization of, if any harm or any pro problem arises. So we are going to speak, it's a journey as Emma described, that we will be speaking about safeguarding as a whole package from the policy till the implementation. So please uh, keep in touch with us and you will be following those, let's say, cycles of, com of, of conversations. For people who couldn't even write in the chat or had some problems with connectivity, please write to us back, write to Shanaz, subscribe to the newsletter, raise any question and we will, be, we will make sure to follow up with you and share different resources. Some people have completed the online module one and they found it useful. So please stay with us and follow up with us and you will see different modules are translated into the local language in your own language and uh, you will receive more and more. It was an effect effective discussion and some people thanked Matt at the beginning in addition to Emma when they started the chat. And actually, it's not only an initiative. People write in the chat, it's it's initiative. It's just, it's something from community to community. And um, as a catalyst, we say that uh, we are there to support. If there is no more questions, I think now that is the time we have for today. And once more, we thank all of our, let's say, guest speakers and panelists for their informative presentations. And to all of you, thank you from the Resource and Support Hub. And thank you for attendees for the engaging and challenging questions. If you want to hear more about further Resource and Support Hub webinars, events, or if you would like us to visit you in your, in your let's say, region, please contact us, subscribe to our newsletter. And all, all those links are on the chat from FCDO. Who, who were the first speakers today to the central team and Bangladesh Hub and myself. Thank you very much and see you soon.